In this mini tutorial, we're going to think about the basal ganglia and we're going to think about a way to approach the basal ganglia circuitry, uh, which is hopefully quite simple and accessible and relatively easy for you to interpret. Um, so let's just start off and think about what the whole um, purpose of the basal ganglia is. Now, the basal ganglia are very, very complex parts of the brain. And we are not yet at a point where we fully understand their function. The function of the basal ganglia still is very mysterious and poorly understood. And so therefore, what we have to do is just produce working models of the basal ganglia. And this has actually helped us to produce novel therapies, such as um, deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease. Now, we're going to look at the circuit um, on the left-hand side in more detail soon but let's just remind ourselves of the important brain structures in the basal ganglia so i'll draw your attention to the images on the right hand side here is a coronal section through the brain and here's a transverse section through the midbrain specifically okay you can see for example there's the cerebral aqueduct so here's the midbrain this is a coronal section through the cerebral hemispheres and we're going to just look at some of the basic parts of the basal ganglia. Um, the first part I want to point out to you um, is this triangular shaped region here, okay? This um, whole region is called the lentiform nucleus, the lentiform nucleus. Um, let's just write that down, the uh, lentiform nucleus. And the lentiform nucleus is composed of three important components. Uh, the superficial most part of the lentiform nucleus here is the putamen. Then we go one layer deeper to find the globus pallidus, and this is the external segment of the globus pallidus. And finally, we have one layer deeper still, the internal segment of the globus pallidus. So the lentiform nucleus is made up of three components, putamen, globus pallidus external, globus pallidus internal. So these are major parts of the basal ganglia. Um, another important part of the basal ganglia um, is up here. This is the chordate nucleus, and we've talked about that previously in one of these short videos. Um, another bit that you're already familiar with sits here, and this is the thalamus. Okay, this is the thalamus. And then moving on to the section through the midbrain, um, we've got these two important regions, the substantia nigra. Okay, the substantia nigra, which actually has two parts to it. So the substantia nigra um, pars compacta, which on the diagram on the left we can see here, abbreviated to SNC. And there's also the substantia nigra pars reticularis, just here. Okay? But the major part of the substantia nigra, from our point of view, is the pars compacta. So there I've provided um, a very simple overview of the topography of the different components of the basal ganglia. Now let's look at the circuit diagram to the left. Um, now, um, it, it's relatively complex, um, but I want to reassure you that, that I don't expect you to memorise this pathway. The more important thing that you need to do is to interpret it and to work out the effects of stimulation or destruction of a given part of the pathway. So that's more important than you memorising it, although memorising it may help in your case. Now, the main thing we need to realise about the basal ganglia is that they have their effect by stimulating activity in the cerebral cortex. And specifically, we're talking in this case about the motor cortex because we're focusing on movement disorders. So I'll say that again. Um, the major thing that the basal ganglia do is stimulate the motor cortex. Okay? And what that means is that in conditions where the basal ganglia are dysfunctional, for example Parkinson's disease, we may see decreased stimulation of the motor cortex. And indeed we know that in Parkinson's disease there is a paucity of movement and there is, there is this bradykinesia caused by inadequate stimulation of the cortex by the basal ganglia. Now how do the basal ganglia stimulate the cortex? Well, that stimulation of the cortex occurs via the thalamus. Remember that if you want to talk to the cerebral cortex, you have to go via the thalamus.
and the basal ganglia are no exception to this. So their output, the basal ganglia's output, is all through the thalamus. And this is how the basal ganglia are able to stimulate excitation of the motor cortex. Okay? Um, but we're going to look at this now in more detail, but we're going to start off right at the beginning, or one place that you might want to consider as the beginning, and that is the substantia nigra pars compacta. Why have I decided to start there? Well, this is where the dopaminergic neurons are found, which degenerate in Parkinson's disease. Okay, So the dopaminergic neurons, which die off in Parkinson's disease, are found in the substantia nigra pars compacta. So this would be a reasonable place for us to begin in considering the effect of death of these neurons on the amount of cortical activation in Parkinson's disease. But let's look at the normal pathway first. Now, you'll see that um, the basal ganglia circuitry is arranged in two different um, pathways. Originating from the substantia nigra pars compacta, we have a direct pathway, which is relatively short to the thalamus, and an indirect pathway, which is more convoluted in how it gets to the thalamus. So we have a direct and an indirect pathway. There's a lot of detailed reading you could do about these, but I don't want you to get too worried about these details. Just be aware we've got two pathways to the thalamus. Let's consider the direct pathway first. Now in this diagram, purple refers to excitatory connections and black refers to inhibitory connections. So the substantia nigra pars compacta sends excitatory dopaminergic connections to the putamen. Okay? It stimulates the putamen, which in turn inhibits the globus pallidus internal segment. So it inhibits the globus pallidus internal segment, which would normally inhibit the thalamus. So what we've got here, here is an inhibition of inhibition. And what that leads to is we take the brakes off of the thalamus and lead to increased thalamic activity, leading to increased cortical activation. Okay? So the direct pathway leads to increased cortical activation via the thalamus. Now let's look at the indirect pathway. Okay? So in the indirect pathway, we have inhibitory dopaminergic projections going to the putamen. These inhibit inhibitory connections going from the putamen to the globus pallidus external segment, which in turn inhibit globus pallidus external segment projections to the subthalamic nucleus. Okay? So what this means is that we have net um, inhibition of the subthalamic nucleus. If the subthalamic nucleus is inhibited, it doesn't activate the globus pallidus internal segment or the substantia nigra pars reticularis so much, meaning there's not as much inhibition of the thalamus, meaning that cortical activation is greater. So both the direct and indirect pathways effectively take the brakes off of the thalamus, meaning that the cortex can become activated more, meaning that we can initiate more movements. This is the simplistic kind of way I want you to think about the basal ganglia. And in fact, this model, this way of thinking about the basal ganglia, also applies to other conditions that the basal ganglia are implicated in, such as obsessive compulsive disorder and psychosis. Now, at this point, you might be wondering, well, how is it that dopamine is able to have both an excitatory and an inhibitory effect on the putamen. Well, of course, that relates to the types of receptor which that dopamine is activating. Different subtypes of receptor lead to either excitatory or inhibitory effects on the putamen. Now, I understand that this is very complicated and that you may have struggled to follow what we were talking about in the last segment. What I'm going to try and do is give you a very simple way of thinking about this. And, and we're going to use um, a little bit of maths, um, which you've been familiar with for years, in order to make more sense of this pathway. And it all relates to um, multiplication of negative numbers. So what we're going to think about is just 
using a minus sign to represent inhibition in these pathways and a, pos a plus sign to represent excitation. All right? So let's take, for example, the direct pathway from the putamen all the way to the cortex. So we start off um, in the pars compactor of the substantia nigra. So the substantia nigra pars compactor leads to excitation of the putamen, which leads to inhibition of the internal segment of the globus pallidus, which leads to inhibition of the thalamus, which leads to excitation of the cortex. Okay, now I know I've just reiterated what the diagram showed, but now what we do is we look at the signs that we've drawn. Okay, so we've written we've, we've written a positive, a negative, a negative, and a positive. Okay, so what we have got is we've got a positive number multiplied by, in fact I won't use the um, multiplication sign, I'll use just a dot for multiplication. So we've got a positive multiplied by a negative, multiplied by a negative, multiplied by a positive. Now what does that equal? Well, a negative number multiplied by a negative number is a positive number and if you multiply a positive number by a positive number and a positive number you end up still with a positive number so therefore the direct pathway leads to cortical excitation let's see if this works for the indirect pathway so let's draw this out so we've got the pars compactor which for the indirect pathway inhibits the putamen, which inhibits the globus pallidus external segment, which inhibits the subthalamic nucleus, which excites the internal segment of the globus pallidus, which inhibits the thalamus, which excites the cortex okay so let's write this um, in a mathematical form so we've got um, a negative multiplied by a negative multiplied by a negative multiplied by a positive multiplied by a negative multiplied by a positive okay so there we can see that a negative times a negative is a positive a positive times a negative is a negative a negative times a positive is still negative. A negative times a negative is positive. And a positive times a positive is still positive. So the indirect pathway leads to net cortical excitation. Now, a little exercise that you might like to do is to try to simulate some different kinds of disease of the basal ganglia. And you might want to think about it and start off maybe by removing this initial stimulation of the putamen by the pars compactor um, or removing this initial inhibition of the putamen in the indirect pathway and when you work through it you should find a net decrease in cortical excitation so i hope that this slightly unconventional way of looking at the basal ganglia proves useful to you um, and, and that's all i'm going to talk about for the time being okay